All right, I think we're live here. If you can hear me, just post a message on the uh, chat on your YouTube mobile app. I can see myself here. All right, I think we're live here. And forgot to turn the volume off. There we go. All right, we've got two viewers. We're going to get started as soon as we have 30. So bring people in. Bring people in. We had about 60 last time live uh, at the peak. We're going to try to keep this thing going. As long as we get more and more uh, folks participating in the live, uh, and as long as we're getting the views on the back end, I'll keep this going. Anything to help the masses. Uh, I don't have time to help people one on one, but I'm more than happy to help you guys in a massive uh, fashion. Let me turn the lights off here. There we go. It's a little better on the eyes. We're up to 22, 24. Good, good, good. We're going to get this started real quickly. So, um, while we're doing that, I'm going to set the screen up so that I can give you the disclaimer so we can kick into this really quickly. We've got plenty to discuss today, 29. I'm going to assume we're going to hit 30 in a second. So let's go to the screen share. Here we go. All right, quickly on the disclosures. By the way, this is my website. It's just a simple WordPress site. We don't need anything fancy. I'm not trying to make money here. I'm not trying to spend money either. Just trying to donate time to the uh, community of investors out there who are interested in learning, uh, as I did from my mentors, how to do stocks the proper way. Uh, and that education is really what got me here today. Without that, I don't know where I would have been. I was a terrible investor. Uh, before my mentors kind of set me straight. It took me a while. I was really hard headed. I thought I knew how to do it my way, knew um, could, that I could figure out how to do it my way. And I was wrong. Uh, there is uh, many right ways, but you're not going to find many of them. That's like finding Easter eggs in the city. You know, unless you know where they are, uh, you're not going to find them. But once you do know where they are, they're easy to find. So that's what I'm trying to help out with here. Here's a quick disclaimer. You can read this. Uh, on your own, but I'm going to give you the highlights. Uh, this is not a solicitation to buy, sell, or otherwise transact any stock or its derivatives uh, mentioned in this broadcast, nor should it be construed as an endorsement of any particular investment opinion uh, or of the stock's current or future price. To be clear, I am not an investment advisor. I am not providing recommendations, price targets, or opinions about valuation regarding any of the companies discussed herein. Uh, further, this disclosure is true as of the time of this broadcast, and is sub but is subject to change without notice. Also, I frequently trade my positions, often on an intraday basis, which is not really true, but I'm going to say it's true as a disclaimer disclosure. I trade my positions frequently, and therefore it is possible that I might be buying, selling, uh, shorting, uh, using options, any sort of derivative whatsoever to um, place a position on any of these securities that uh, could move in any direction and po possibly even contrary to the contents of this broadcast. Talk about covering your butt. I undertake no responsibility to update anything uh, discussed herein. However, the information I am providing here has been um, from sources that I believe to be accurate but cannot be um, guaranteed to be so. Uh, I think that's about it. All right, so let's cut back to the chase. So we can kick right in, okay? Um, already we have questions about uh, Smith Micro and Helios. Um, I suspect that Helios. We're going to start with Helios today because that's the that's the stock moving the, um, the the most aggressively today, as well as the last few weeks. Um, to the short, to the longs out there, to you bulls, okay? Um, I'm short, but I am not the enemy, okay? In the professional world, when you're dealing with Wall Street, okay, and that's that's all I dealt with until uh, my retirement was Wall Street professionals. People could be on opposite sides of an investment and be completely cordial with one another. In fact, the strongest investors are. Okay, how else am I going to learn the bull case, right? Besides doing my own research, if I don't interact with the bulls who are also looking for the bullish information 
And how will the bears, how will the bulls get the bearish information if not for help with uh, that side of the equation? At the end of the day, if two professionals have all the information and they disagree with the outcome, that's fine. Okay, that's just a matter of opinion at the end of the day, but based on the facts. All right, enough preaching. Let's kick into it. So here's what's happening. Um, again, I'm not the enemy. I'm just telling you facts. In fact, I was the original bull. For those of you who don't know, um, if you can look it up back in September of last year, I did an executive interview with Ted Farnsworth, and I was bullish on Helios's stock based on the business plan, the business plan that they laid out for MoviePass. Now, like any company that lays out a business plan, they tell you how things are going to play out. That's guidance, essentially. So they provided guidance on how the business model was going to work. Okay. I was, uh, and through that guidance, had metrics that I could track to give me a sense as to whether the business model that they expected to work actually was. And it didn't take long, maybe about four to six weeks before I realized it, it really wasn't working so far. Now, that four to six weeks isn't enough, of course. So you had to give them a little bit more time. But in the meantime, the stock got way beyond normal levels of valuation, got ahead of itself, especially for something that wasn't quite working yet. So um, I first got out of the stock, let everybody know through my public site as the 1% portfolio. Um, I'll try to maybe uh, provide a link to that later, but it's in my research on my blog. So check my blog site out and you'll see links to that 1% uh, portfolio. It's all the stocks that I'm really, really interested in. Okay. And uh, I took it off the list uh, at 34. The stock ran at 38 and that was the end of that. It, it started heading down. Now I didn't get bearish. I was neutral. Okay. I did not get bearish on the stock until it was around 12 bucks and I saw an SEC filing. Those are very important to read and learn how to read. Even if you think they're confusing, now, I used to think they were extremely confusing, but you get used to it. It's just like learning another language, okay? And it's valuable because when I read these SEC filings, especially for Helios, I can react immediately, okay? So when it was a 12, I called it a short. And the thing dropped to where it is today. And even when the stock got down to a buck, people thought, now it's a buck. It can't get any lower. Went to 50 cents. Can't get any lower. Got down to 38 cents, and I shorted it. At that point, now, for those who don't know, I made a vow not to short the stock at the beginning of the year so that people would know that I was 100% unbiased in my research. Of course, I'm biased now because I have a short position. But that really, that bias, I'm not really biased. I'm honest because I have to be honest with myself. I don't care, you know, if, I, if some information comes in on this broadcast that tells me, oh my goodness, I really should not be short, I'll tell you on this broadcast, all right? Maybe I'll tell you five minutes afterwards because I'll quickly cover my short, but I'll tell you immediately. You're not going to get much delay. And I'm not bringing anybody into cahoots here, okay? Uh, for those of you, some, a lot of you already know, most of you should already know I had a run-in with the SEC. And I don't want another one of those, okay? We settled uh, out of court on that. You can read about it on my blog site. We've been talking about that a long time. Uh, I'm here to give you an honest education. So... Blah, blah, blah aside, we already just blew through eight minutes of the broadcast. Let's get to the meat, all right? Here's the meat. Um, as we've been discussing, the last few SEC filings have discussed guidance for their cash burn, okay? And the cash burn is expected to be $45 million this month, and they said that it was going to increase going forward, okay? So... The And now that's not necessarily bad, right? Because some companies, as they grow, they need more cash to grow bigger. Amazon started doing, you know, billion-dollar financings, right? So why not MoviePass? Sure, why not? The difference is that you have to have institutional support, okay? When you have institutional support, if you look back at uh, Gaia, G-A-I-A, they did a round of funding. Uh, it was a best efforts funding, kind of like what uh, uh, Helios tried to do last week. And... Usually that knocks the stock down. The announcement that they're going to do a best efforts financing usually knocks the stock down. Well, in the case of Gaia, the stock actually went up because as the story got out about who Gaia was and why they needed the money, people went, the institutions, professionals went nuts for the stock. And that stock went from, uh, it was probably about 15 bucks at the time. It went to 16 or 17 and now it's in the 20s. Okay. That's what you get when a story is working. Their metrics are working. 
movie passes metrics have not been working and so the institutions are getting increasingly scared to invest in the company and that's why each round is happening at a lower level okay now the problem with that is if they say that they're going to need more money next month than this month and the stock is declining then they're going to have to issue even more shares not just more shares but more and more shares right if you're going to have you need 45 million this month when the stock is at 30 cents how many shares are you going to have to issue when you need 50 million next month at 15 cents big difference right you can do the math and that's what's been really pressuring the stock because as the stock continues to go lower they're issuing increasing numbers of shares so you guys are fighting against movie pass not against me okay because the capital requirements um, if you don't know what a capital requirement is, look it up. But the capital requirements make it very difficult for me to short the stock. I have a very small short position because of the capital requirements. Once the reverse split goes through, I can short like eight times more with the same amount of capital. Okay? They want the reverse split, I think, partly because the investors that have been helping to finance the company do so because they can short the stock and offset um, the long position that they're promising. The company all right if you don't understand how that works look at my past videos or, and look it up that's the mechanism these guys are arbs they're doing an arb okay they can't really do an arb effectively with the stock in the pennies so they got to do a reverse split to re-enable that in other words the company is making it easier for institutions to short the stock in your face okay um that's just the way it is so um now the problem that we have here is um, they did an ATM, the 150 million ATM that made the stock go down 33% a day back when the stock was at four bucks. Okay. They did uh, a preferred and convert, uh, just a few weeks ago. They got 20 million from that and, you know, promises to get more in the future, but the stock quickly ripped down and that forced them in a position where it, the ATM wasn't working properly. The convert preferred deal wasn't working properly. So they announced the best efforts last week via the SEC filing, okay? Now, best efforts deal usually goes down in 24 hours. You can't leave that hanging out there because investors start to sniff weakness and they'll short the stock, short the stock, short the stock even more. I did immediately. As soon as I saw that they were doing a best efforts offering, the stock was already down 5% in after hours. That wasn't enough, in my opinion, uh, for what they were doing. I think they're going to have to offer a steep discount to get the deal done. At least I thought they were going to need to do a steep discount. Well, no discount was steep enough. They had to postpone the offering because they couldn't get the deal done in the normal 24 hours or 48 or 72. By the end of the week, they announced this on Monday, I believe, and by Friday they said, we're not doing this. So where's the money coming from? Okay, Because they need money. They need to raise money to fund the cash burn. Okay, So that's what happened um, you know, on Friday and over the weekend. What we noticed was surge pricing went wild. There's complaints all over the place that there were um, matinee shows for movies that aren't popular where they were doing surge pr pricing. Uh, empty theaters where there's surge pricing. Okay, The app stopped working. In other words, you couldn't actually get a pass for a movie. You couldn't use your movie pass even though you paid for it. Okay, If you piece all of this together, now I can't say that every one of those issues were not explainable but the fact of the matter is, is that all of these events the postponement of the best efforts offering the surge pricing gone wild and the app stopping to work they're all moving in the wrong direction they all suggest that the company is desperate for cash and doing all they can to preserve what cash they have left okay and this is why i entitled this q a can hmny go bankrupt this is the first time i'm going to use the b word First time, I've never said before that there's a, it, there's a risk of Helios going bankrupt. I've said that there's an event horizon here, a black hole, and they've been hanging out over here, but they can always pull back before they get to what's called the event horizon, where you get sucked into the hole. You, don't, you have no hope of reversing the thrusters. Look that up if you don't understand what that is. It's important, okay? Because the cash that they've been raising has gotten them closer and closer to that horizon because of the... Uh, parabolic nature of the share count moving up okay it makes it more difficult for a professional investor to want to do a deal with them okay and that's who's being targeted the professional investors you don't have brokers calling you asking if you want to participate in their round of funding it's just not efficient for them 
Okay, so that's the problem happening from the professional Wall Street side of the equation. And that poses a risk that if they can't get funding soon, they might actually end up having to declare bankruptcy. First time I'm going to say it, and I'm not the first to say it because in their latest SEC filings from late last week, they actually used the I word insolvency. That's a proxy for bankruptcy. Okay. They're starting to put contingencies in place in the event of bankruptcy. Why? Because it's a risk. Okay. So uh, I'm not saying it's going to happen. I'm saying that it's now risky, that they're close enough to the black hole now that they really need to reverse thrusters in the search pricing and turning off the app. If they turned it off for whatever reason, it stopped working, right? It slows the cash burn, at least temporarily, to kind of help um, reduce the odds. Uh, that they go bankrupt uh, or hit that event horizon before they find that next round of funding they need. In other words, they're trying to reverse the thrusters a little bit. That's good news if you're afraid of bankruptcy, but it's bad news because they need money to keep them out of bankruptcy. It's a sign that they're actually in trouble. Okay, so um, that's what I saw this weekend. And, um, you know, obviously we're coming out of the summer blockbuster season, but you know, I originally said that that would be the time to, to cover your shorts and, and then maybe the stock could do well in August, September, October before the holiday season. But management guidance says that they're going to increase the cash burn in the next month. So there's nothing to analyze. We don't need to analyze movies anymore. Uh, you notice I'm not talking about how big, um, you know, the weekend was for movies as much as I was before because it's all baked into the guidance. All right. So this is a very easy story to follow now. Because we know how much money they need, they've told us. We know how much money they're raising because it's uh, listed kind of publicly. All right. Let's go to the questions finally. Um, and maybe I answered all of these already. I'm going to skip the Smith Micro questions at first, but let's see. Um, for HMNY, is naked shorting a legit problem? Would stopping it make a difference in the shares? Maybe, maybe not. Um, I, I'm not aware of the extent to which naked shorting is occurring in Helio shares. I, I'm more concerned, honestly, because of the capital requirements, I'm more concerned about the, the real shorting that's going on from the institutions like a Hudson Bay. You know, if Hudson Bay is going to uh, give them another $20 million, it'll have to be at a steep discount to market. Watch my other videos where I said if you can buy bananas down the street for 70 cents and the store up the street is paying a buck, you're just going to go back and forth all day. Grab all the bananas you can at 70 cents and sell them for a buck. That's what ARBs, A-R-B, ARBs do. And Hudson Bay is very much uh, one of the, I would say, very successful ARBs out there. Hate them if you want. But this is, this is business. This is Wall Street, okay? And companies make money any way they can on Wall Street. And this is one of Hudson Bay's fortes, and you have to give them credit for that, okay? What are the chances HMY bounces back? Um, you know, I can't speak to the stock, all right? But as far as the company goes, what I just described, they got to reverse thrusters. They've got to trim down the business. They need to stop all that cash burn. They're talking about increasing their cash burn. Uh, it tells me that their CFO, or whoever is advising them financially, has no idea what the principles of, of cash raising is. Do you think if it was easy to raise hundreds of millions of dollars, that companies wouldn't just do what they're doing. Let's set up a look. Let's let's merge into a shell. And who wants to do this with me? Let's start a uh, let's start a company. Let's start a public company. We'll merge into a, a public shell, reverse split to twenty bucks, and then initiate an ATM for one hundred and fifty mil, right? And just sell shares, sell shares, sell shares, sell shares, Right. And all the money that comes in, well, it can just go right into our pockets because we can give ourselves a nice fat salary. Sound familiar? I'm not trying to be facetious or sarcastic. This is actually what's happening with these guys. All right. So what are the chances they bounce back? Well, what are the chances that they can reverse thrusters enough to get away from that event horizon? That's what we're monitoring. Right. And right now it's not looking so good because they're not raising money and they're increasing the cash burn. That's the opposite of what they need. They need to be raising money and decreasing their cash burn. That's what you want to watch for, and that's not a day-to-day -day event, right? Um, it could be now. I'm, I'm, I can't, like, watch out for the next 8K. The next 8K could be a bombshell. Nice hat. Thank you. It's the Money Mark hat, okay? For those of you who saw, um, you know, I'm a very much a uh, 
um, a kind of person that when I get interested in something, I dive in, I learn everything about it. And uh, I got interested in battle rap. And so I, I actually, um, a couple of months ago, decided I was going to do a battle rap competition, believe it or not. Uh, learn everything I could, YouTube videos, learning about how to construct rhyme flows. Um, it's uh, not PG. At the end, it was, you know, I, I was going to a very adult battle rapping competition and I was Money Mark and uh, actually um, won my competition. So, you know, it's a checkbox on the bucket list of life, all right? One at a time, you take these things and you focus heavily and you can succeed at almost anything. You know, uh, we were born with brains, all right? And if we use them, if we spend time learning instead of trying to be smart, you can't be smart unless you learn, all right? I spend most of my time learning and I spend, what, this hour a couple times a week spitting out what I've learned. I'm not telling you I'm smart. I'm not. I'm a dummy. I was a dummy when I started the stock game, all right? And I'm a relative dummy now compared to some of these professionals out there. So I continue to spend the other 23 hours a day learning so that I can become better at this. I'm sacrificing this hour to, to just share what I'm learning. And, and it brings back a lot because you guys feed me information. It helps me learn faster. Think about it. All right, let's go. Um, do you think they are willingly not going into debt or is it more about no one willing to give them traditional financing like other companies? Do you think the SEC has their eyes on this yet? Um, okay, the last question. Yeah, I think the SEC has their eyes on it because enough people have probably complained. OK, um, that's what happened to me. Enough people complain and the SEC is going to investigate and some of the branches of the SEC don't have too much more to do. Um, people have gotten a lot more cautious out there. So they're going to check things out that don't look um, don't look quite on the up and up. And, and so they probably got their eyes on this. I wouldn't worry too much about that, really. I don't think that's a, I think it's a non issue at this point in terms of the uh, financing side, though. Yeah. Who's going to give them debt right now? Um, I think it's more likely, honestly. That, um, you know, from what I've heard from different back channels, I have the feeling that um, there are folks that want Ted Farnsworth out of the equation. <clears throat> OK, <clears throat> they feel like given a better management team, right, where let's say Ted is out of the equation or a chief marketing officer, where Mitch Lowe is um, more of a chief operating officer because he's got tremendous knowledge in that regard. But I just don't think he's done a very good job. You know, as the CEO of MoviePass, no offense, Mitch, not saying I could do better, right? But my job is to judge you and your stock, your company, and your valuation. Um, and from that perspective, relative to what investors are expecting, you guys aren't cutting the mustard. And in fact, uh, you know, Ted has ruffled some feathers. I like him personally as a guy. I think he's, I think he's a, a nice, personable guy. Uh, but from a Wall Street stock perspective, pure business perspective, I think there's a lot of people that want him out. What easier way to get them out than to have the company go bankrupt? And then you can purchase the assets out of a reorg, instill your own management team without worrying about uh, the voting structure. And not for nothing, but I, if I was Mitch, I would be actually hoping for that because my stake in the company has been turned to nothing. His, his stake in the company is virtually nil. He's just getting a paycheck right now. So, you know, if they go bankrupt, um, whoever takes them out of, out of bankruptcy, I think they're going to want, if I did it, if I take uh, MoviePass out of bankruptcy, I want Mitch there, but I want a stronger management team, a better CFO, a different CEO, an actual CEO, right? Um, you know, do I want Ted to remain on board? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know enough about, you know, what kind of feathers he might've ruffled in Hollywood. If, he, if he's ruffled feathers in Hollywood, he has to go and be replaced by somebody else despite his skills. And that's what, that's business. That's how business works. So, you know, be careful of that. Um, but definitely, why would anybody give them debt financing when uh, bankruptcy is a high risk? The discount on the debt financing would be extraordinary. They're actually getting a much better deal by selling shares um, because you guys, you know, the longs, the, bull, the bulls are supporting the stock. Um, okay, let's go. Um, Are there times you use other methods besides fundamentals in your calculation for a company's product when doing your analysis? Example, anger on social media over movie pass or app store reviews for Smith Micro. No, those things are like minor. Like, first of all, you got to figure out, you got to think about sample size. So yeah, fundamentals are everything. But the question is what goes into the fundamentals? It's not just numbers. Okay. I have a movie pass model. I've been tracking their cash burn and their subscribers. Those are metrics. Metrics are not 
the end of the world. Okay. In fact, I care more about um, looking at a company from the standpoint of its business model and how much money they can drive to the bottom line. That's operating leverage. Look that word up. If you don't understand it, Google it. Operating leverage. Okay. For me, operating leverage is the most important. I don't look at PE. I don't look at revenue multiples. I look at operating leverage. That tells me how much money they can make in the future. All right. And now if the company is burning cash, I mean, yeah, if they're burning cash, raising money, increasing the number of shares outstanding. What I want to find out is I want to model a company out in the future and say, how many shares are they going to have outstanding uh, when they turn a profitable turn profitable? How profitable can they become in the years that follow that? How many shares will be outstanding at that point based on all the money that they've raised up until that point? So I get a sense as to what the stock is going to look, what the company is going to look like in a few years. And therefore, I can figure out what kind of valuation they can get in a few years. That contrasts that to people who watch charts all day. One, if you're watching a chart all day, you're not learning anything about the company. Two, you're not looking at the big picture, the long term. OK, uh, for those of you who saw my Gaia chart, right, it's based on a point in the future. Right. And that point in the future represents the valuation that they will have if management hits their long term guidance. They provided long term guidance. Right. It's about fifty dollars is that it works out to if management can hit their long term guidance, the stock's worth 50. And I said, OK, here's where they are now. And I straight line it kind of and say, OK, if they hit all of their short term guidances because they give guidance every quarter. OK but they've also given long-term guidance. Obviously, if they hit every step along the way, then they're gonna hit this goal in the future, right? So this is how you can figure what a stock ought to do. Now, of course, if you wanna trade the ups and downs that happen on the way there, that's fine. And in fact, it's easier to do if you have confidence in the path. But the reason that the bulls have had trouble trading Helios' stock is that the path, is down, not up. You've been trying to call a bottom and say that the stock is going to, you know, um, turn and start moving in the opposite direction. But the fundamentals are what really govern whether that path should be up or down in general. Okay, so that's the difference between buying a dip and catching a falling knife. Okay. Now, as far as those other data points, you know, um, angry people and uh, movie reviews and uh, not movie reviews, app reviews, you have to look behind under the covers. First, do you have a statistically significant sample size? Two, what's the trend? Three, what kind? where's that feedback back coming from and do you look into it? All right. I say it all the time. A data point is worth a zero. Zero. A data point is worth a zero unless you analyze it. You've got to dig into that data point, see where it came from, see what makes it tick. OK, that's where most investors fall down. And it's a very it's it's a it's a lazy step to not to take a data point and not analyze it. And that comes down to what I teach about confirmation bias and recency bias. Those are the two biggest plagues of an investor. If you're not making as much money as you think you ought to be making, it's probably because of one of these two things. OK, you're taking data points. And you're waiting them in your head, wait, waiting them in your head to confirm your bias. If you're bullish, you'll take a data point and say, Ooh, uh, that's a bullish data point, but it doesn't really matter. I throw that one out. Here's a, 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 a bullish data point. I hope I said bearish data point with this one. Here's a bullish data point. That's really important. That, that proves that this company is doing great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's confirmation bias. You have to learn how to weight these things on a scale right objectively your opinion doesn't count your opinion doesn't matter you are one person out of millions hundreds of millions a sample size of one among hundreds of millions is not statistically significant so you have to analyze these data points all right so i've explained all this in some of my past research especially with the smith micro and the reviews the smith micro reviews are worthless and by the way they've been moving up dramatically but they're still worthless because of the, con the, the, the construct of those uh, reviews, they can't be relied upon. They couldn't be rel relied upon when they were bearish, and they can't be relied upon now that they're bullish. What can you rely upon? Research. And we've done research. I did a multi-person uh, study. A lot of you folks who are on this broadcast today participated on it. So be on my blog, and you'll find out how you can participate in those as well and be the first one to get the information on these things. Real research. All right, let's go to the next. Um,
Hey, appreciate it, Kevin. Look, you know, um, I, I see what happens on stock twits. I see what happens in the chat boards. People love just bickering back and forth. If you're not with me, you're against me. That's amateur hour. That's how to be weak. Okay, people that beat each other down, stay down. People that help each other up, get up. Imagine being a multimillionaire, being able to make seven figures a year as being a wall that you have to climb over. If you get over that wall, you're in seven figure a year land. But it's a tall wall. If you're not there already, you already know it's a tall wall because you're not there yet. If it was a short wall, you would just step over it and be there. You'd be making seven figures a year. So why aren't you? Because it's a tall wall. You need people to push you up and help you over the wall. All right. And that requires allies. And it also requires trust because the people that push you over the wall say what? What do they say? They say, I'll help you over the wall if you pull me up once you get on the top of the wall. Right. So it requires a lot. And so that's what that's what happened to me. I was lucky. I had somebody on already on the top of the wall say, hey, let me pull you up because you're going to help me climb a bigger wall, not the seven figure wall, the eight figure wall. OK, I've helped enable eight figure years for people and probably more. But, you know, I can't I, got, I don't have the specific stories, but I got specific stories on the eights. OK, so if you want to just keep beating each other up, you're a bear. You suck. You're a bull. You suck. Throw all the shade at me. You want. I don't care about that stuff. All you're doing, all you're doing as, a, as somebody who throws shade on somebody else, if the person that you're throwing it on is a professional, if, you, if it's an amateur, they're just going to throw shade back on you and you guys are just going to beat each other down and never get up. If you're throwing it at a professional, that tells a professional, well, that's somebody I don't want to help over the wall. Simple. Reported, blocked, bye-bye. That's fine with me. If you enjoy life better by just making fun of other people, if that's what makes you feel fulfilled, I have no problem with that. Honestly, it's not sarcasm. If, if that's what you want to do with your life, it's your life. You have the right to do that. But if you would prefer to make millions of dollars and be able to do whatever you want with your life, then rethink that process because I'm looking at you guys and saying, I'm never helping that guy over the wall. Right? Next. Uh, when you short a stock, is there a time limit you need to cover the position by? Uh, does the days to cover ratio estimate go into this time frame? Um, yeah, a lot of people look at that stuff, right? Yeah, it makes a short look scary. Um, you know, the how 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 much uh, it's shorted, how many days to cover there are. These are things that create scariness. I don't deal with scariness. In fact, I like to jump into things that other people are afraid of. When I shorted Helios at 38 cents, people thought I was crazy. Even the bears thought I was crazy. It's 38 cents, right? That's what I loved about it. All right, it's a heavily shorted stock, stay away. It's 38 cents, stay away. Well, that for me, that's great. That's from a psychological perspective. That means everybody's afraid of it. That's not the reason I shorted at 38 though, at all, zero. It made me feel more comfortable about doing it because I knew nobody else was. But what made me do it, look at my last videos about valuing, how to value MoviePass. I think there's something the way the title says, uh, Mitch tells you how to value MoviePass. Watch that video, all right? I, I went through that process of figuring out how to value MoviePass subscribers, did the calculations, and determined that the stock had almost no upside relative to the downside. In fact, you know, I think I came to the conclusion personally that the stock is, was probably worth five cents. So if the stock's at 38, why don't I short it if it's going to five in my personal analysis, you know, conclusions? Nothing to do with my opinion, it's just what the math told me, all right? I thought it was crazy to short it at 38 cents too, but the math said do it. You know, you don't make money by being a homo sapien here. You get make money by being Mr. Spock, being a computer. It's the computers that are making money out there, right? All right. As far as time frame goes, same deal, right? If the stock gets down to four cents and I think it's worth five, or even if the stock gets down to seven cents and I think it's five, well, there's not much meat left on the bone with the short, then I can cover at that point. I don't care about anything else. I care about valuation and valuation only, only what is the thing worth? Now, the rest of you guys that, that don't understand how to do valuation analysis, you're reaching in the dark, looking at charts for signs, for signals. 
Well, guess who do you who do you think are throwing those signals? When a stock breaks out, who do you think causes that breakout? Guys like me who have done the valuation analysis, oh wow, that stock ain't worth 10 bucks, it's worth 20. And if everybody figures that out at once, like what happened with like Turtle Beach at the LD Micro Conference, if you were there, you're probably a professional investor. And you took the time out. I didn't even look at a stock that day. I looked at companies, all right? I wasn't looking at charts. I wasn't looking at stock prices. I was watching CEOs present because that told me where the stock was going. So you might think that I'm flying blind by not looking at charts and quotes. I haven't done it today, right? But it's the opposite. By learning about the company, by sitting down with the CEO and running the numbers quickly on my pad while he was speaking, I was like, oh my God, this stock is going to go berserk once other investors sit down with the CEO. And I built a huge position and made a lot of money already on it. Okay? That's how you do it. Next. Um, Bob Vissi in an updated model claims 75% of subs will pay peak dollar per month at $2 average, blah, blah, blah. Um, okay. Uh, he's making suppositions. There's nothing wrong with that. You, you can have an opinion about how a certain strategy is going to work. Surge pricing might do this for Helios, uh, for MoviePass. Um, raising the subscription from a 10 bucks to 20 bucks might do this for MoviePass. Might, might, might. We're not dealing with mites. Okay. You got to uh, might sleep your home. Um, so l what you got to do is observe what's happening. Yes, you have to have a hypothesis, not an opinion, but a hypothesis. There's a difference, right? With an opinion, you can be proved wrong. With a hypothesis, you're the one trying to prove the hypothesis wrong. And it's the, the hypothesis that ends wrong. Kind of just an ego thing, right? So you don't feel stupid if you find out that what you thought was wrong. Because it's not your thought. It's just a hypothesis. It's just a starting point. And then you research and see what the truth is. It's the truth that makes you money, not opinion. Okay? So looking at this, the truth is that guidance from management is that they're losing $45 million this month and plan to lose more money in the future. That guidance is backed up by the $1.2 billion uh, filing that they did with the SEC. And Ted subsequently saying in an interview that they plan that he would like to tap that 1.2 billion within one to two years. That's 12 to 24 months. That's 500. That's 50 to 100 million per month. So the numbers match. He wants to pull in 50 to 100 million per month, and the company is guiding to 45 million of loss and increasing in the future. That say 45 goes to 50, goes to 100 eventually. So the numbers all match. That's what management, that's what the company is telling us their plan is, okay? There's nothing wrong with that, again, except that they're a bit misguided in terms of their ability to raise that money, and that's what's bringing them towards the event horizon. That's the main problem I have with them, not whether or not the business plan model is actually going to work. The company could succeed in this plan, but they can't raise the money for it. They can't succeed. That's been the problem from day one, the capital structure. Look that up, too. I'm talking about it in previous videos. All right, let's keep going. Um, uh, all right, I'm going to go back. I've talked enough about Helios for now. I'm going to take more Helios questions, but let's go back and reward the people who asked the original questions. We're going to talk about more stocks, and we're also going to talk about Helios as I reach more questions about Helios, okay? So, um, First of all, let's see. Here we go. Mark, I've been hearing that Smith Safe and Found Ramp has been slow but progressing. Um, do you likewise not expect anything exciting from Q2 numbers? What's your time for the next stock market crash? Stock market crash, who knows? Okay. Um, depending on what you call a crash, uh, you know, if 10% is a, a crash as opposed to a correction, right? We haven't had a correction, a 10% drop uh, since like 2009 it's overdue, right? But who can guess, right? If it hasn't happened in nine years, that's almost 2,500 trading days. Your odds of guessing what day it is in the future might be one in 2,500. So I don't guess like that, right? I deal with valuations. And what's great about dealing with valuations, if you understand the valuation of all the companies that you deal with, when you can't find any attractive stocks to buy, it's usually a sign that the stock market's overvalued, right? And if you find, conversely, if you find a lot of stocks that you think you should short, it's a time, that's usually a sign that the stock market's overvalued, all right? Now, getting to your question about Smith Micro, 
Um, I provided a lot of research about that already. All right, I've heard all the things that you've heard. Okay, I'm not worried about any of those things. In fact, I got an update last week and I promised that I would share that. So let's share that real quickly here. Okay, um, one, the company's got all the funding it needs. So this is not another Helios from that perspective, right? Um, they don't need additional operating expenses. That's great news. That means any revenue that comes in, most of it can drop right to the bottom line. There's that operating leverage, right? Um, they're guiding uh, to that flat operating level uh, of expenses. Um, but they have the opportunity to uh, cut more expenses, all right? So that's a positive. That means that they can get closer to profitability even if Safe and Found doesn't work out. Now, Safe and Found is working out. What you're hearing about um, not blowing up, you know, progressing steadily, yes, of course it's progressing steadily. They're not even in all the sprint stores yet, all right? And until they're in all the sprint stores, and that's 4,000 stores, you don't, you don't roll a product out into 4,000 stores overnight. They've been doing it already. It's been it's already been several weeks, not even really months yet. Okay, four thousand stores, the big endeavor. But they've been moving very rapidly. Okay, at the beginning of June, I estimate they were in twenty five percent of the stores, kind of aggressively. Now I estimate that they're in seventy five percent of the stores, pretty aggressively. Now once they get up to hundred percent, that's when the corporate message is going to go out to all those stores and say, okay, you guys are all all have safe and found. Now here's the corporate edict. Here's how many you have to sell per week okay and that's where things really rip up in the meantime i think they tripled tripled their revenue on safe and found this quarter if that's not good progress i don't know what is in addition to the fact that when i talk to the company they've got safe path and com suite not just safe path but com suite as well as a growth engine okay they believe that they can be profitable profitable without safe and found okay so that limits your downside risk on, on smith micro um the r d headcount has remained flat Okay, so they still have the headcount in place. They're still developing product, even though they brought the operating expenses down. And just one or two more quick data points, and we'll move on to like Turtle Beach and some other exciting names, right? Um, for those of you looking at the uh, location labs, um, hold on a sec. All right, good. Uh, for those of you looking at the location labs delay in terms of sunsetting that product, could that be, you know, obviously that's a short term negative, right? Because we want that product sunsetted. That'll be a great event when it's eventually, when it's sunsetted because it'll bring 3.5 million per quarter of revenue to Smith. But what I really like about the delay, honestly, is that it shows how hard it is to get a product ripped out of a carrier, even a really, really bad one like Location Labs. So now when you take a really, really good one like Smith, think about how hard that's going to be to rip out, right? It's really, really good news for them in the long term. And remember, I look at valuations on the long term. Professionals look at long term valuation. They're going to see this positively, not negatively. All right. So you can sell your stock now, but when the earnings call comes up and they talk about being able to reach profitability and they talk about where uh, this product is going, it's all going to be positive to a professional investor. And I've seen this happen before where a stock reports earnings, drops like five to seven percent at the open and then ends the day up five or seven percent who lost out the professionals or the um, retail investors it's an easy guess because the professional investors were salivating they were like oh these guys got it wrong the stock belongs up here not down here on this kind of short-term stuff they got to be looking long term because the value of a stock is the long term the cumulative discounted cash flows that's a long-term measure and that is the pure measure of what a stock is worth okay so um i think that's about covers it as far as that goes oh the last point on them uh real quickly um the the tone that i got from them with regard to t-mobile was really really bullish okay um they talked about t-mobile's new product um family mode they said it's not a competitor i agree i used family mode okay this again data points versus analysis when the data point came that T-Mobile was rolling out family mode, I said, okay, that's a data point. Let's analyze it. Let's get a T-Mobile account. I actually happen to have one, so that was easy. Get the application, use the application, and get the experience. It's terrible. It's a terrible product, okay? And it's not really competitive with what Smith Micro's product does. So, right? And then they're giving us very bullish vibes about what they think is going to happen at T-Mobile. Okay, I love it. So let's move on to some more questions. Let's move on to more stocks. Um, you know what I'm going to do now is just take different um, 
uh, questions on different stocks, and then we'll go back and get the repetitive questions. So no more Smith and Helios at the moment. Let's talk about some other stocks and see how you can make money on some other stocks. See if we can find any here. Um, let's see. Here we go. Turtle Beach. Would you mind discussing your opinion on the outlook for this company near and midterm? Uh, appreciate all you do. Thanks, Holden. Uh, okay, so Turtle Beach, it's been a hotbed stock. That stock's gone from two to 20 plus uh, in a very short period of time. My take on the situation is it's a heavily shorted stock and it kind of makes sense, right? If a stock goes from two to 20 real quick and all they do is sell headphones and the reason that the headphones are selling is because of a, a hot video game, well, the video game's gonna become not hot anymore and then the headphones are not gonna sell anymore. It's a simplistic bear case, okay? Um, I thought that was a valid bear case, but I was like, okay, let me actually investigate to see if that hypothesis is correct. When I looked into it, couldn't be further from the truth. Um, Fortnite and PUBG are not just video games. They're what I believe to be the first in a, in a number of video games that are come, gonna come out in this new genre, all right? If you take like um, these, uh, battle games, these war games, right, that people play, that has a very strong niche, okay, with certain players that buy the headphones and they're playing in teams online. It's a niche. What Fortnite did was took that niche and made it appeal to the masses. They made the controllers easier. They made the game more social. They made the game less bloody. And so now instead of, you know, 25-year-old um, males playing a war game, you've got 25 year old females, you've got third graders, you've got 45 year old males, females, what have you. You have a big broad demographic and all of a sudden the appeal to headphones is just blown up. And if you read the data points in the news, it's actually accelerating, not just linear, it's accelerating. So um, the biggest risk to Turtle Beach right now is can they get enough parts to make enough headphones for all the demand that they're seeing, in my opinion. All right. So those that are shorting the stock, I don't think that you're going to be able to make money on this stock as a short until after Christmas, at least, because I think headphones are going to be a very hot Christmas item. Ask around about that and you'll find out for yourself. OK, so what I've done is I own a little bit of the stock. But what I do have is I have a huge option position because there's a lot of people out there willing to pay a heavy premium for the January options betting on the stock being below 1750 and below fifteen dollars and below twelve fifty. In January, I, I don't listen. I think it's a very low probability bet that this stock is below 1250 in January. If nothing, I think it, it, rather than being 10 points lower, it could be 10 points higher, and therefore those options are going to be worth zero. Those put options will be worth zero. So I I wrote a ton of them. I shorted a ton of those options because I think they're worth two bucks today. I think they're going to be worth zero come January. I'll make a hundred percent. Those of you who buy at 20 and ride it to 30, you make 50%. I'm going to make 100. Okay, that's strategy. All right, let's see if we can find another question about another company. Um, anybody have any questions about any of the companies I follow? Um, while we're waiting for that, I'll go back and get to the next question, no matter what it's about. Um, let's see. And it's 118, so we've got 12 minutes left here, and you've got 52 viewers still on board. So we're going to keep this going until uh, 1.30, as long as the viewership stays high, as long as the questions come in. Uh, let's see, next question here. What about the multiple invested ventures, EFO and movie phone? Are other sources covering for those losses? Um, Okay, so they have movie, you know, so they got a number of ventures going on here, right? They bought Movie Phone, they got Movie Pass Ventures, they got Movie Pass Films, right? Um, my sense is that uh, Movie Phone, you know, that's a nice asset, but I think it's burning cash right now because they're trying to figure out how to restructure that and roll it out, okay? Movie Pass Films definitely losing money, Movie Pass Ventures losing money. Why? And for a noble purpose, right? Because you have to make films, you have to acquire films. So that's the purpose of those vehicles to make films and acquire films. All right, um, that takes money. You need to raise cash if you don't have the cash to acquire a film. You need to raise cash if you don't have cash to make a new film, all right? And if you're talking about like Gotti was like a $10 million budget, and then you gotta do the advertising, and advertising a little easier for MoviePass because they've got the MoviePass mechanisms, that's nice. So maybe let's say it costs them $15 million 
per movie. And they want to do 12 to 15 of them over the next year. They've said that. They said they want to do 12 to 15 movies in the next year, right? So you can do the math on that. The midpoint of the, that range is like 200 million. They want to spend about 200 million over the next year. And a movie requires, I mean, it takes at least a year to get a movie done, right? Uh, I got to actually do my research on that. But I, usually it takes, you know, a couple of years to, to make a movie. So they could be burning through 200 million a year for the next two years before the first movie comes out of that pipeline and starts generating money for them. Okay. So that's where that event horizon comes in where they have to raise money until they can start making money. Now, if they acquire a movie like, the, you know, the Gaudi movie and the, uh, the American Animals movie, they can acquire a movie that already exists. They can get that out into the theaters more quickly and see if they can be successful with that. But as we saw, um, they didn't see much success with those movies. So that's a little problematic, but that's off the course. Um, the fact of the matter is that these guys are investing for the future. They want $1.2 billion to become what they want to be. And that could be great. That could be, in a, that could be a really spectacular organization if they can raise the money to pull it off, right? Couldn't you guys do great things? If somebody came to you with a check for a billion dollars, couldn't you build a great company, um, right? You've got great ideas out there, but no money to, to, or, or time to pull it off. But if somebody gave you a billion dollars and said, give yourself a salary, build a great company, okay? But who's doing that? Nobody's giving me a billion dollars. I can build great companies and nobody's come to me with that, right? So um, let's keep going. What is the real risk of MoviePass diluting HMNY ownership from the current 92% to less than 50% to remove head once Ted once the anti-dilute clause lapses in August? Something to worry about or no? The anti-dilute is kind of moot point at this point, right? Because HMNY already owns essentially 100% of MoviePass, and therefore they have all the you know most of the they have the voting rights. They they control they control the company. So anti-dilute is. Uh, expiration, I don't think really has any bearing on the situation at all anymore. Um, I'm happy to entertain if somebody wants to email me, uh, if a professional knows more about how this stuff works. But my sense is that if all the control and all the shares are in the hands of HMNY, um, you know, legally it is uh, an owned entity. They're essentially a merged entity in the eyes of the law. And, and so anti dilutes irrelevant because it's just an, an, uh, a unit of the parent, right? Um, let's see. Mm. Hey, Kevin, I, I'd love to chat with you. I just can't do it. You know, um, one on one, it's really difficult. You see, I'm reaching, um, 50 people here all at once in a one hour. That's one minute per person. And then, um, some of my, you know, my month old videos are approaching a thousand views, right? So I can over, for the course of time, I'm reaching a thousand people, uh, giving up one hour of my day. So you can kind of do the math on that. Um, you know, in my professional life, I charge three thousand an hour. It is is my hourly consultant rate to institutions that want to speak to me for an hour. Um, so you know, the reason for that is that that to me, an hour of research can make me three thousand dollars if I spend a hundred hours. Uh, looking at a stock, researching a stock, I can make 300 grand on that stock. You know, I'm pulling seven figures a year. So um, it's nothing against you personally, but I, I, I do all my uh, donation of time to you folks in this venue so you can ask questions in this venue so I can help you and answer all of those questions. Any question, right? It could be about me, it could be about the stocks. If I know the answer, I'll give you the answer. If I don't know the answer, I'll say, I don't know. I'm still stupid in that regard and I still have to learn that aspect of stocks. Right. That's how you really, um, you know, gain people's respect, honestly. Right. Um, my mentor actually gets ultimate respect from companies when we have conference calls with them, not from what he knows, but from the questions he asks. The last call I was on with him, the CEO afterwards contacted me and said, that guy you were on the call with, he, he's a really big deal, isn't he? I said, why? What makes you say that? He goes, he asked me a question that nobody ever asked me before. The question mark made him look smart, not the comments with a period at the end. Think about it, all right? It proves that you're a person who seeks the answer as opposed to thinking he knows the answer. I may seem like I know the answers because I'm always spitting answers instead of asking questions. Well, I'm asking questions of my colleagues and I'm spitting the answers out to you folks. I'm sharing. I'm not trying to seem smart. I'm just sharing. If I was trying to seem smart, I wouldn't be dressed like this right now.
<laughs> um, let's keep going. We got five more minutes. Let's see what we can get. What about Herbalife as a short? I don't know Herbalife. Um, I tried to learn about Herbalife. It's out of my um, my brain capacity. Um, I'm a specialist on technology. I have lots of contacts in the technology realm, so I can uh, vet a technology. Okay, so if I don't understand the technology, I can find out uh, about it from somebody who's a professional, somebody who's dealing with technology. Workday. I have workday contacts. People who are dealing with workday on a daily basis and can give me feedback on how good or bad the application is. That enabled me to go short several years ago and make money. Enabled me to go long more recently and make a lot of money because it wasn't ready before and it is ready now. Where do I get that information from? People in the industry. Okay, I don't have any people in the industry on a Herbalife, uh, and so I'll give you a shorter answer. If I don't know, it's the same answer as I just gave for Herbalife as far as um, my domain expertise, my ability to analyze the situation. I stay away from what I can't understand. Okay, next. Via the Sprint add-on services page, this service is no longer available. Check out Safe and Found for more security options. Uh, yeah, yeah, they're not offering Location Labs anymore, but they haven't sunsetted it yet. If you're a customer of Location Labs, you can keep it for now, but they're trying to push you over to Safe and Found because it's a more strategic application that they're going to explode into other areas in the future. Look at my past research for more on that. Um, let's see, Herbalife is a short. We talked about that already. What about Sears Holding? Uh, I don't know Sears either, so we'll move on to the next one. Um, do you still issue red and yellow alerts on the market? No, um, especially not the yellows. Um, you know, I'll do something like that in the future. You know, when I said if, if, if I'm having a hard time finding longs, I'll let you know. If I'm having a hard time finding shorts, I'll let you know. That'll be kind of an indicator as to whether or not the market's too high or too low. Uh, but yellow alerts are really tricky. I did, a, I did a good job on them for a while, and then I uh, didn't do a good job on them for a while. That's, that's the nature of making short-term calls. As far as red alerts go, you can bet your butt. Um, I've only issued two red alerts in my entire life. One was at the top of the internet bubble. The other was at the top of the real estate bubble. If we get another thing like that. I'll let you know. I don't. See, I don't even see red in the distance. Okay. Uh, we might hit a recession sometime in the not too distant future, especially over this trade war stuff, right? Uh, and if we reach a certain um, kind of, there's a lot of mechanisms we can't get into now with regard to economics. Um, you know, so a recession could hit. That wouldn't necessarily be a real red alert. Uh, I'm talking about crash alerts. Uh, a recession could certainly take the stock down 20 or 30 percent, which would be traumatic, right? Uh, and I'll keep my eyes out for that. But definitely, the red alerts are where you can really, really make money. That's that changed my life. Being long uh, stock, uh, internet stocks until I saw the crash coming, and then being short internet stocks uh, enabled me to keep not only keep the money that I made on the internet bubble, but make more on the way down, and then go real long at the bottom and make even more on the way up. Uh, I've talked about it before, the difference between the two, if you take two people in the same spot and one rides it up and down and the other one rides it up and, and goes short on the way down and then goes up later, uh, the difference in the amount of money that those two people have, if one has 100 grand and the other has 100 grand, when the market finally recovers to where it originally was, the person with 100 grand still has 100 grand because they rode it through thick and thin and they're back to where they started, but the other person that rode it up and then made money on the way down and then made money on the, on the rebound, has a million. So the difference is literally a zero at the end of your net worth if you pull, play this right, okay? Um, <clears throat> next question. Hey, Mark, I read a report about a stock that has 80% short interest. The company is doing a buyback that once completed would make the interest over 100%. Is that possible? Yes, yeah, possible. Naked shorting could take short interest over 100%. Um, so company doing a buyback is always interesting in my opinion, all right, uh, because it usually shows confidence on the part of management. If they think the stock is overvalued, I mean undervalued, um, you know, they, they might do a buyback, but they're not going to do a buyback if they think the stock is overvalued, all right? Conversely, if a company thinks their stock is significantly undervalued, they're not going to issue shares if they can help it. So that's something to think about with HMNY, right? It's the fact that they're still out there raising money in this regard, not worried about the dilution, tells us that they don't think that the stock is significantly undervalued. All right. They may have gotten a lowball offer that puts the stock undervalued in their mind where they didn't think it was attractive enough, but just something to think about there. Okay. Um, <clears throat> what's the stock symbol of the short you just mentioned? Um, which short that I just mentioned? Uh, tell me what the name of the, the company was and I'll tell you um, what the symbol is. 
uh, or you can find it obviously, or just watch the replay of this. Is there a point where you're at such a loss in a stock that you feel it's better to ride it out and see what happens or sell at that loss? No, don't do that folks. Don't do that. Always make a move on a stock based on the valuation, not based on your gain or loss. Don't take a gain or a loss. Make a move at the right time. I don't even look at my gains or losses. All right. I don't look at my gains or losses. When the time comes to buy or cover or sell a stock based on the valuation that I see, I don't look at what price I paid for it or what price I shorted it at. I make the move. And it makes it easier for me to not look at the profit or loss because then I don't think, oh, I'm down. Maybe I should wait until I'm up. Maybe I should wait until I'm up. How are you going to be up if you just found information that told you to sell the stock? If you want to, if you want to get your money back, sell the stock and short it, right? If you found information that says that the stock's overvalued, make the right move at the right time. Forget about how much money you've made or lost because you're going to lose more and make less by thinking about those things. At the end of the year, right, at the end of the year, I look at my profit or loss when I fill out my paperwork to go to my accountant for the IRS. And that's when I find out how much money I made, not on a stock to stock basis. And guess what? That number always has two commas, seven digits. All right. So you can watch your profit and loss on each position or you can make a bigger profit at the end of the year. Which one do you want to do? Do you want to count commas? Or do you want to have them? Next. Mark, do you think they will wait as long as possible to do the reverse split? No, they got to do that reverse split as soon as possible. Watch the early part of this broadcast to find out why. All right. Um, and we're at uh, – it's, it's been an hour, so no more questions. Uh, Lindell Moore, I'm giving you the last uh, say today. Uh, it was the last short I mentioned regarding the headphones. No, it's not a short. It's a long. I, what I shorted, What I shorted were the put options. Right. So if you understand options, you understand that call options are if you're bullish and put options are if you're bearish. So what I'm doing is shorting the put options. People who are bearish are buying puts against uh, Turtle Beach, H-E-A-R, H-E-A-R. They're buying puts because they think the stock's going to go down. All right. Uh, and in particular, the ones I'm really attracted to are the ones that are for January. $12.50 strike price. There are people who actually believe the stock's going to be below $12.50 in January. I think there's very little chance of that happening, and yet they're paying two bucks for the right to sell the stock at $12.50 in January. I think that option is going to be worth zero, so I'm shorting it because I think I'm going to go from $2 to zero between now and January. I'll make 100% between now and January sell, shorting those put options. Okay, hope that clears that up. <clears throat> um, one more snuck in here. When companies announce a planned reverse split with SEC filing, how soon does it actually execute? Just look, read the SEC filing. They're going to do a special meeting coming up, uh, I think, in a few days to vote on the reverse split. They've already put the votes in place to mine. Uh, as far as I'm figuring out, they even did as part of the convert preferred financing. They made it a stipulation that those shares are going to have to vote in favor of the reverse split. Listen, those of you who are thinking about this reverse split, they want it to happen. You're, you're hoping it doesn't, but they want it to happen. They're taking every step possible to make sure it happens. So unless you can find a way to stop it from happening, you have to assume it's going to happen. If you don't like it, if you think a reverse split is bearish, as I do, you can't be in the stock. Get out. It, you know, would, is what I would do. I don't, I can't give you advice. I'm not an advisor. I don't like to stay away from that, but it's only common sense. If you think a reverse split is negative for the stock and the company's doing everything they can to make a reverse split go through, they haven't been mandated. The SEC didn't tell them to reverse the stock. They did. They want the reverse split to take place. If you read the SEC filings, they even say, if we don't reverse split, it's going to be harder for us to raise money. And it's already hard enough for them to raise money right now. They have to postpone the offering. Okay. So, Okay, um, that's it for today. We're just over an hour. We'll do this again, maybe even this week. We have plenty of viewers. Hey, let tell people about us. You know, tell people about this Q and A session. Uh, subscribe to me on YouTube. Subscribe to me my my blog page, right? Because uh, I'm going to keep raising up how many viewers we want here. I'm not going to raise it significantly. This time we started at 30. Next time maybe we'll start at like 40 or 50. And as long as there's 50 of you, um, I'm going to be fine. I'm not going to get to the. I'm not going to get greedy here. I like helping you folks out. We got. 
well over 60 viewers today. Thank you for that. I appreciate your trust in me. Hopefully you're getting something out of it in terms of education. We'll come back and do it again soon. Take care.